mystery Babylon as found in Bible prophecy. And let's read Revelation 17. This is where, uh, where this, uh, this term comes up. Uh, verses 1 through 13 of Revelation 17. It says this, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. Now this was John, the Apostle John, who's getting the revelation here and recording it. He says, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit unto the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness in her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name, written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast." These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So we're going to try to unravel some of this tonight. We're not going to unpack all of it for you, but we're going to try to do what we can in the time we have tonight to look at this question, what is this mystery Babylon? Who is this woman in this passage? And uh, can we get any more information about um, what, what might be coming forward in Bible prophecy? So let's have a word of prayer tonight, and we'll get looking at this. Lord, I thank you for our time tonight. I thank you for your goodness to us, and I thank you that you hold all of the future in your hands. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just help us to have clarity tonight as we look to the prophecies of Scripture, and uh, may we find, uh, uh, find hope in, in you as a result of looking ahead at what's, uh, what's to come. We thank you for it, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Mystery Babylon, you know, this is a difficult question. The question came in to me, uh, I, I get lots of articles, I have a whole shelf of books in my library on prophecy, and you can, you can go all kinds of directions. I've seen everything under the sun in terms of what, uh, what ideas people have come up with in related to prophecy. And, uh, and I'll just say this about prophecy um, in general. Um, our, our tendency is to look at prophecy and look at imagery like this, which we know are symbols, and so therefore we assume this is obviously not literal. There is not a literal woman. There is not a literal beast, uh, so to speak. Uh, and so because we, we kind of understand that when we read something like this, um, we, um, we tend to say, well, it's got to be symbolic. But that's true. But the problem is, oftentimes we then say, well, that means we're free to associate these symbols with anything we choose. And you'll find people do just that. They, they make these associations with, oh, I can see these connections, or this is how it, it's all going to work out. Um, and, um, and sometimes we, uh, we, we maybe make some associations that the Bible doesn't intend us to make. And we also need to recognize when we look at prophecy of any kind, and especially when you look at how prophecy has been fulfilled, through the Old Testament prophets, um, they are 
They are oftentimes interpreted, most of the time, prophecies do have uh, information that helps us to understand what the symbolism means. And so um, oftentimes we, we can, by looking at more context, by comparing it to other passages, we understand an interpretation for what the symbols uh, really respond and what they really mean. And I think this is interesting because um, I'll just give you a, a for instance. This is looking at the future, obviously. None of us have been there yet. Uh, none of us know exactly what's coming down the pike. So let's preface our understanding with the fact that we may not understand all of the details and how it's all going to work out until you actually get to that point in time. Um, I'll give you, for instance, we know back in Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel, he predicted the rise of the Greek empire, right? Uh, that, was, that was foretold in Bible prophecy before uh, the Greeks arose. And of course, the great commander of the Greek empire was Alexander the Great, right? Well, um, until Alexander the Great came on the scene and very quickly took over with his armies much of the ancient world in such a you know, complete and brutal fashion, no one would have conceived that there could be somebody who could have taken over that much of the world in that short of a time, except for the people that had the prophecy. And here's something interesting we don't always see. Daniel told them that it was going to happen. And the story goes from historians outside of the Bible that as Alexander approached Jerusalem, for his conquest, part of his conquest in the, in the course of expanding the Greek Empire. As he approached Jerusalem, uh, a group of scribes and leaders of the temple, people who knew the Bible, they came out to meet him outside the walls of Jerusalem. And they said, we knew you were coming. In fact, we said, here is exactly, and they just showed him the passage in the book of Daniel that told about him and his overcoming of the whole world. And they said, we, we know that you're going to defeat not just Jerusalem, but you're going to defeat much of the ancient world, which he did end up going on to do. How did they know that? Well, the Bible didn't say, Alexander the Great's coming of this year, this day, and you go out and stand in the field and meet him. What they did was they understood from prophecy, it was so clear when they were living in that moment that this was a fulfillment that they went out and expressed that to him in that way. So sometimes we don't always know those details until... You're there in the day. So let's just recognize that off the top because prophecy, yeah, it can be fulfilled the way God chooses. We may not know how all the details work. With that said, let's look at a couple of, of, of basic information. We'll try to unpack a little bit about this Babylon that's re referred here. And uh, by the way, this, this idea of mystery Babylon that we see in verse 5, that's this name that's written on the forehead of this woman, um, it's, uh, this is the only time it's mentioned in the Bible in this fashion. Of course, Babylon itself, or the word Babel, is mentioned hundreds of times in Scripture. This is the only time as a title with mystery Babylon. Its place is, is, is right here in Revelation 17. But let's give a couple of other descriptions of who this is. Um, it says in verse 1, it says, This is the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Um, so we see it's a woman. We see it's a woman who's not of good repute. That's the picture, the symbol that's given. Uh, verse 3, it says, It's a woman that sits upon a scarlet-colored beast. So obviously there is a, there's an affiliation here with the beast, which we know later to be a representation of the Antichrist. We see in verse 4 that the woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet color. So she's dressed in purple and red. The purple, of course, is a symbol oftentimes of, of royalty or kingship, uh, some type of, uh, of authority in that, that area. And we see in verse 6 that the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs. So obviously they've had something to do with the martyrdom of many Christians throughout the church age. Um, Again, these are just general points that we need to understand that the Bible expects you to kind of understand as you unpack what this prophecy is all about. So let's, let's look at the symbolism of Babylon itself. Let's go back and give ourselves a little history because we need the context. Um, what do we know about Babylon? I think this is very interesting because here we are at the end of the book of Revelation, future time, end times, when just before Christ comes, there's Babylon mentioned again. But do you realize that Babylon is mentioned all throughout the Bible? 
In fact, you can go back as an ancient city clear to Genesis 10, just shortly after Noah gets off the ark, uh, Babel, the Tower of Babel, this is where Babylon comes from, is be beginning to be mentioned. It's, it, this, this, this idea of Babylon as an ancient city is used over 350 times in the Bible and re refers to a location that was at one time the headquarters for a one-world government and a one-world religion. That's interesting. This is what's being prophesied in the future. This is the center of it. Let's go back. If you want to turn there, you can. Or you can just uh, let me turn. But it's Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. There's a couple of interesting passages about the beginnings of Babylon. Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. This is shortly after, uh, after the generations of Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the ones that had made it through the flood, get off the ark. Uh, here, just a few verses down, in verse 8, it said, Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Of course, we don't say that much today, but uh, that's what they said back then. Verse 10, it says, here's the interesting thing. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Okay, so we have a location, the land of Shinar, and we say the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was here in, um, in Babel. So what do we know about Babel? We'll turn over one chapter to chapter 11. We know, of course, the story, but this is interesting. Verse 1 of chapter 11, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, verse 2, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Isn't that where Babel was located? And that was just mentioned about Nimrod. This was where he went. It says, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. What was the great sin of the people of Babel? What was the great sin of the Tower of Babel? Well, we oftentimes say, well, you know, God was afraid that they were going to be able to build a tower big enough that they could reach heaven and, and steal his kingdom from them. I mean, that's fairy tale stuff, right? <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. Um, you know, oftentimes you see in the kids' books these giant, you know, winding staircase to heaven that they're, that they're building, and uh, God has to destroy it because otherwise they might reach up to him. Uh, that's, that's not the idea behind this. What was the problem that they, were, that they were saying here? They says, we're one people. We're one world, and we are going to make a name for ourselves. <laughs> we don't need God. This was the whole point of what they're saying here. We don't need God to rule us. We'll make a name for ourselves. We're all one language. We've all got one ruler. We've got Nimrod here, beginning of the kingdom. He's the mightiest guy in the land. He's the great hunter. And he is going to kind of rule us all. He is the originator of a one world government and a one world religion that basically says, we don't need God. We have God right here. Does this not sound familiar to what's going to happen in the end times? <laughs> There will be a one world government, the Bible tells us. There will be a one world leader who says, hey, we don't need government. We don't need, we don't need God. We need government. We need me to kind of, I'll just be the king. And what does he end up doing? He goes and sets up his throne in the temple in Jerusalem because he says, you don't need to worship God. You got me. And this is exactly a repeat of what happens with Nimrod in the same place, right? The Tower of Babel, the city of Babylon, all Tied again to Babylon. It's established as a great city, but it also has this beginning tie-in as a blasphemous cult, doesn't it? There's this blasphemy that starts from the very beginning. So keep that in mind. Here's our context. What else do we know about Babylon? We also know Babylon in Scripture as a world empire, of course, and as in history. The Babylonians, as a nation, they came back again even after Babel was destroyed. The Babylonians became a great nation. 
from roughly the same area. It's mainly where present-day Iraq is. It's not very far from Baghdad, about 25 miles the, the city of Babylon was. Um, and, um, and it still is today, by the way. There are still people there. Um, but uh, Babylon as a world empire uh, became on the scene, and it was prophesied in Scripture as one of the great empires uh, that would rule the world. And uh, they took Israel captive. Uh, remember, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in and uh, laid Israel waste. They took him captive. Both Ezekiel and Daniel the prophets lived through and wrote about this Babylonian captivity that they were a part of and experienced firsthand. And uh, much, in fact, much of the Old Testament, I don't know if you've recognized this, but most of the Old Testament that we hold in our hands today was compiled and um, preserved through that Babylonian captivity. It was a priest like Ezra that came out of that, the scribes like Ezra and others, that were instrumental in gathering and preserving and keeping the scriptures together and coherent so that when they left that Babylonian captivity and were allowed to eventually come back uh, and rebuild under uh, Nehemiah and some of the others, that they had the scriptures to come with them. So what do we know about Babylon as a world empire? Well, let's turn to the book of Daniel. We'll read a couple of verses here. Um, an interesting couple of thoughts here. I can find Daniel. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 and uh, verse 31. Of course, we don't have time to... I'm doing the best I can to skim through the, top, the top, part, top peaks here. We can't get into every detail. But Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, it says, um, There was a dream. Of course, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of the Babylonian Empire at the time. And uh, he didn't know his dream. And he comes to Daniel, who is not, able, not only able to tell him his dream, but tell him the interpretation of it. So in verse 31, Daniel speaks to King Nebuchadnezzar of Daniel 2, and he says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. The great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. And the image was this statue, right? Verse 32, The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of of iron and part of clay. And so we know based on these, and again, we can't get into all this, they each represented parts of the world empires that would reign successively over all of the earth. We have the gold head was Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon. It was the head, right? And we work our way down until we get to the Roman Empire, which were the legs of iron. And we, the Greeks and everybody else was in between. So these were important uh, understandings for Daniel to have. Down in verse 36, here's what Daniel says about this. He says, this is the dream. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven, and earth, God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them are, over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So he's saying, hey, you are, you're the first. You're the one of gold. You're the one that's started them all. Babylon, right? Again, Babylon's significant as a world empire. So, again, this is just so we have a little bit of background as we begin to pull out from Revelation 17 what could be then spoken of regarding this mystery Babylon uh, in Revelation 17. So let's head back there. And I want to share with you, there's a lot we could get into. There's a lot of details. But, you know, when you have prophecy, and there are some interpretations of things, what we should begin with is, what's the clearest information we have? Let's not look for the muddiest detail. Let's not look for the most uncertain thing. Let's look at just, again, this is just a simple way to look at it. Uh, four identifying features that are clearly explained in Revelation 17. And then we're going to see how they might apply to, um, to different uh, possibilities of mystery Babylon. 
So the first thing we see is in Revelation 17, 2. It says this, The kings of the earth have committed fornication with this, this, uh, this woman. Um, and so we see that we have a unholy alliance, if you will. <laughs> there is a corruption that's occurring, either politically or spiritually, it doesn't say, with the other leaders of the world. So in other words, what we see is this, uh, this, this woman that's being described as a nation of some type uh, has some type of merit, has some type of clout, has a great association, affiliation, and corruption with other, uh, other great nations of the world. So they have merit in some sense on the world stage. So let's remember that. Let's look at the second point, Revelation 17, 5. The actual uh, verse in uh, verse 5, in terms of the title, uh, afterwards, Mystery Babylon, it's called the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So it's the mother of abominations. Anytime that word mother is used, you can understand what the idea is. This is, this is from which all of these things have come. <laughs> this, is, this is the place that what gave birth to all of the harlotry and abominations that we find in the earth. The originator of all types of evils that have happened here on the earth. This is the mother of them all. That's the idea behind this, okay? So keep these in mind. So it has merit with other nations. Whatever is nations being described here is the mother of abominations. Verse 6 says that this is the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So whatever, whatever country or nation or whatever we call this, we know that it's responsible for great numbers of people who have been martyred, Christians who have been martyred, uh, not just throughout the ages, but through the church age. So somehow this nation is directly involved and culpable for the martyrdom of many followers of the church during the, the last 2,000 years. Okay, and the third thing, the fourth thing we find in verse 9, it says the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So the location, it has been given here. It's given a, a geographical location. In other words, this, I'll put it this way simply to keep it alliterated, it's on the map. It's a place that's literally on the map somewhere. Okay, so it has merit with other countries. It has the mother of abominations. It's responsible for martyrdom, and it's somehow on the map. It's not just a symbol. It's a literal place, okay? So let's keep this in mind, and I want to share with you three different views, and we'll apply these criteria to those and maybe come up with some answers. At least I'll give you where, where I think we, I land on it, uh, but I can't be sure until, again, until the day comes. So there's three, I think, three key views, three credible views, um, maybe some more credible than others, about what Mystery Babylon is. Obviously, there's a nation somehow that's going to arise, it's going to have power, it's going to have credibility with other nations, it's going to be um, full of every evil you can imagine, <laughs> and it's going to be responsible for martyring a lot of Christians. Okay, the one that, uh, that I've gotten, and I've gotten different articles on this, is what about America? What about our country? Where, where do we stand in terms of Bible prophecy? And some have proposed, and you say, well, th these don't sound like us. Uh, we're all, go all goody-goodies here. You know, we're a Christian nation, right? Uh, but uh, as we all know, America is changing, right? All America isn't what it was founded upon. Um, and some have proposed that, um, that uh, we could look at all of this imagery and look at it symbolically, and we can apply different things to our country. I can't give everything, but we also know that what is America? We're the only superpower on the planet right now, right? Um, I think maybe that's a question anymore. I think China and Russia are both raising the ranks pretty quickly. But uh, for at least quite a, quite a while, America was a great superpower. In many ways, we reign over the earth as a, as a, as a great nation. And by virtue of our status, uh, this is where the UN convenes, right? A lot of people think end times prophecy, it's going to come through the United Nations because how... How much easier would it be than to create a one world government than through the UN? Uh, so that's a very possible uh, option that we could consider. Um, some, I don't know if you've even heard this, have said that the Statue of Liberty itself 
which we think of as a statue for freedom, uh, is actually, think about, this, think about the symbolism here, the woman in Revelation is holding a golden cup. Okay, we're holding a, she's holding a torch, right? And it says, it says seven rays are coming out from their head. Do you know how many of those little things come out from her head? There's seven, okay? There's imagery there, there's symbolism. Uh, when you compare it to this woman of Babylon. And apparently the French sculpture of the, sculptor of the Statue of Liberty, um, of course it was a gift from France, you know, uh, in what, 1886 I think it was. And uh, he, he originally wanted to make a sculpture of the Babylonian goddess of Ishtar, which is the cult religion of Babylon. Uh, and in fact, they, some people say that the shape of the face and things is formed after that very Babylonian goddess. Okay, I'm just giving you the arguments. I'm not going to say this is, you know, let's, uh, let's squirrel this away now. But let's compare it to the four clear things that we've talked about. Okay, merit. Does America have merit with other countries? Sure it does. Um, we, uh, we're a key political superpower, there's no question. We have lots of affiliations and contacts. Um, the mother of abominations. Would you call America the mother of abominations? Um, some would say that they could argue that because, look, there's so much of the sin that's in the world that originates here from Hollywood and our media and whatnot. Um, but... Um, I would say this is a, this is a questionable thing. Uh, if, if America had been around from the beginning of time, maybe that may be different. But uh, we definitely have an influence on the abominations of the world. But um, we may promote sin in this country. We may embrace it. But I think we maybe would be hard-pressed to say we're the mother of abominations. Uh, we might be a child of it, but I don't know if we're a mother of it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, to go there. Let's look at the third point. They have a reputation for martyring Christians. How many Christians were martyred in America last year? I don't know of any reports of any that have been martyred. Uh, that's not to say that we might not grow, go into a phase where many Christians become martyred here. But nonetheless, I don't think that's a, we don't have a reputation for that. Um, are we a physical location on the map? Absolutely. But are we a place that's located on seven hills? Um, the scripture is very clear. This place has to be located on seven hills. I think you're far-fetched to try to say America is, has seven hills that, uh, that are its defining geographic characteristics. So I think we have a little bit fall short with America, as much as we like to say, where's America in prophecy? Um, so let's look at the, the second question. Again, I'm not telling you, you know, you believe what you want with it. I'm not going to tell you this is how it is, but I, I want, you, want you to think through this logically. Let's look at the second per perspective, and there's lots of Bible scholars that would go with this one. This is a little bit more popular one. America is a little bit more of a newer one, and that is, what if this is literally Babylon? Literally the city or the country of Babylon that where Babylon is hosted, where it's, it's at. Um, you know, Babylon has never been fully destroyed as a country. Uh, even today, you can go to the city of ancient city of Babylon, and there are people living there. Uh, it's no great city. It's this is not one of the wonders of the ancient world like it was in the day. Uh, it's a city that's mostly in ruins, but yet it's there. It's, like I said, about 25 miles uh, from Baghdad in Iraq, uh, but uh, it's still inhabited. And in fact, at, it, in the past, it has been a great city. As I mentioned, Alexander the Great earlier, Alexander the Great, uh, shortly after he Con conquered all of his kingdom, he set up the capital of his Greek empire at the time in Babylon. Babylon was the place he thought was the most central place to which to rule the world, the ancient world of his time. Of course, it was short-lived. He didn't, he didn't live long after that. But, uh, but nonetheless, it has had prominence in the past. Um, so let's compare our four points again. Does it have merit? Um, well, I think we would say it doesn't have a lot of influence in today's economic powers, right? It's, it's no superpower. Uh, it's not really hardly a city at all. Uh, it, uh, in order to fulfill this, this city's going to have to rise to some great prominence and become some great political power again in order to be able to say this is a literal city. Um, it's not really a player on the world stage today. What about calling it the mother of abominations? Well, according to Genesis 10, according to even 
uh, you know, the Daniel's day with the Babylonian Empire, they were a wicked group of people. And that was definitely a place where you could say, there, there's the, there's the originator of it. But go back to Nimrod, go back to him and his elevating of the one world government. We could argue this is the mother of abominations. What about martyrdom? Have they been known for martyring Christians since the time of the church age? Well, no, because Babylon and the city, even the country of Iraq, for the most, of the most of the church age, had nothing to do with martyring Christians, unless you would argue that during the Arab, uh, you know, the Arab takeover of the world, there were a lot of Christians uh, killed during that time. But uh, I don't know that you could link it directly to Babylon. And the, third, the fourth thing is, is it on the map? Yeah, it's a physical location. But, again, does it sit on seven mountains? Uh, no. There's no geography around uh, Babylon that identifies it with seven mountains. So we have a problem there. And, again, this is just four simple uh, criteria that we've got to evaluate. We can look at a lot more. Let's look at the last one, and I think this one becomes most, the most understood. Again, we may not understand the details, uh, but it's the most commonly held one amongst conservative scholars, and that is... Could this be Rome? Could this be um, either the city of Rome or we look at it as the Roman, Roman Empire? When you say the word Rome, uh, it can represent either a political power and an empire. Of course, we know the Roman Empire and some form of it, the revived Roman Empire, will become that final kingdom that we saw in the statue. Those ten toes, that clay mixed with iron. That iron is what? Some, some of the same iron that was in the legs of the statue, which represented the Roman Empire. So some form of a revived Roman Empire is, is going to be around here at the end times. But we also know sometimes Rome rem represents a religious system uh, in terms of the Roman Catholic Church. They have their own, um, you know, uh, uh, world presence there. The Vatican is represented as its own country in Rome. And so you could look at this from two angles, either a political uh, revival with Rome as its center or a, uh, or a religious system in which the Catholic Church has something to play. So let's la ask the four questions again of Rome. What about merit? Well, does it have a, a, a presence on the world stage today? Well, I think not as big a presence as some of the other nations right now. Um, but um, what, uh, what, what do we know about the country of Rome? Well, right now it's part of the European Union. Uh, and as part of that, it, it becomes one of the world players along with the rest of the countries of Europe that have joined them. And, uh, and it very well could rise to become a player on the world stage if it, this revived Roman Empire uh, comes to fruition. And uh, so the stage is set for them to rise, to be a player like that. But... Um, I don't think we could say in great detail that they are right now. Could we say that they are the mother of abominations? Well, um, again, you have to argue one way or the other re regarding this. Some would say that uh, have argued that the Roman Catholic Church was a successor uh, back in the days of Constantine to the uh, pagan religion of ancient Babylon. And I can't get into all the reasons why that could be true, but some of the practices and symbols that are used within the church uh, have been traced to Babylonian roots. And so, um, you know, there are, of course, a lot of falsehoods that the, the Catholic Church teaches in terms of salvation and what the Bible says. And so you could say, hey, there's some abominations there. But, um, you know, yeah, where's the argument go? We have to, you know, weigh that, weigh that carefully. Um, I don't think you need to jump on, again, any of these things. You can't jump on the bandwagon too fully with any of them. <laughs> and I think that's what we have to be careful of, uh, to say, yeah, I put all my eggs in this basket, and this is how it's going to be. The third one I think is interesting. Uh, can we say that Rome has martyred Christians? Very much so. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, especially during the Inquisition and in the Middle Ages, people who weren't who were believers that were part of the, the Bible-believing churches, they were all but extinguished. Estimates say well over 50 million Christians were martyred by the Church of Rome. And uh, you think about what 50 million people could represent. It's more than any wars that have ever happened in history. Uh, 50 million people is an extraordinary number. And the church is responsible for those martyrs, those deaths. Uh, they were martyred by the Church of Rome. 
And I think the final thing, and this is the most interesting, this is a physical location. And it's situated on seven mountains. Uh, the city of Rome was founded uh, by Romulus uh, on what are to seven mountains. You can go there today. They each have names. Uh, they each have very, very well marked. It is, in fact, a nickname for Rome is the city of seven mountains. Uh, that's one of the nicknames for Rome. And if you look at the world map and you... You go Google it, you say, what, are, what other geographic locations do we have in the world that are marked or known by their seven mountains? Rome is it. <laughs> Rome's the only place that, that meets those criteria. So, um, again, there are, uh, there are questions about any of these particular views. Um, I think our strongest uh, pers pros perspective for this is, is Rome, either as a political power or in conjunction with the, the church in Rome. Um, but, you know, I think, again, until we go and get to that point, uh, we, uh, we can't say with certainty. But I think when the day comes, just like when the Jews went out and met Alexander the Great and said, hey, this is obvious, you're the guy here, I think it's going to be obvious at that point in time who it is. And uh, the good news is this. Let me tell you the good news about all this prophecy stuff. <laughs> If you know the Lord is Savior, you're not going to be there to worry about it. <laughs> here's the short story. <laughs> if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, here's the next event you're looking forward to when Christ comes in the clouds and calls us up to meet Him in the air. And all the dead in Christ shall rise before us. We shall meet Him in the air. And do you know what? We're going to get to watch this from box seats in heaven's view. <laughs> And we can sit there and we can debate all day long. See, I told you it was Rome or yeah, I knew I knew it was going to be America. You know what? We're going to be out of the picture at that point in time. And that's an amazing promise of Scripture that, hey, all this is going to play out in the world stage. We're going to be witnesses to it. But in the end, Christ is going to come down. And what happens to all of these one world governments? They go away. Because when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and he puts to rest with just one simple word, all of the nations of the earth. And they will all either be destroyed or they'll bow to him and name him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's something there's no question about. There's no doubt about it in scripture in terms of what Christ is going to do. And so the question becomes for us, not always, hey, how to figure all this out, but do we know where we're going? Do we know whose side we're on? And when there is one kingdom to rule for the next thousand years, are we going to be ruling and reigning with him? Or are we going to be part of that kingdom that thought they could do it on their own? And that's the sad thing. Many people are going to be deceived through that time. Let's make sure you know the Lord is your Savior. Because if you do... You don't have to worry about all the darkness and trials that are going to happen in the book of Revelation because much of them are going to happen while we're swept away and enjoying our time with the Lord in person.